Good Thursday, everyone, and thank you for joining me for episode 38 of the Southern Conservative Podcast. My name is Ty. There will not be a podcast tomorrow, in case you were wondering. So only two podcasts this week, but we certainly have a lot to get into. I want to first start with the gun control rally that was held in Washington last weekend. The so-called March for Our Lives rally was billed by the left-wing media as a gun control rally made up of America's youth by the hundreds of thousands. And indeed, when I was in Maryland last weekend, the local newspaper up there called it a gun control rally. So that's what America sees this as. Well, we got some data about the rally, and as it turns out, there were very few students at the rally. Only 10% of the crowd consisted of students. The rest were adults, who were at the rally for a whole host of reasons. The bottom line is this. There was no coordinated message. Sure, you could say that the rally was about gun control, but that wasn't the intention of everyone at the rally. There was no central theme. And there was not honest, decent discussion of gun rights and the Second Amendment. Instead, you had David Hogg, who has become CNN's protege, being a flamethrower and honestly a pure brat. If I have to hear one more time that the NRA has blood on its hands, or the NRA is responsible for the deaths in Florida. Then there was a girl who wore a green jacket that had the Cuban flag on one of the sleeves. I'm sure you've seen the pictures. How un-American can you be? Do you think the citizens of Cuba have the right to speak out against the government or to organize a protest of this size? Of course not. These kids have all the appreciation in the world for the First Amendment, but have no problem taking the Second Amendment and tossing it out the window. But what is the NRA? It's an organization made up of people, around 5 million people who want the Second Amendment protected. The NRA teaches about the Second Amendment. It teaches about the proper use of guns and gun safety. Not one mass shooting in this country has been caused by a member of the NRA. The NRA is an organization. The NRA did not pull the trigger to slaughter students in a high school in Florida last month. But you know what organization actively kills people? Planned Parenthood. That organization is responsible for over 300,000 deaths every single year. Again, there was no clear, coordinated message. And when you don't have a coordinated message, the whole point of the rally fizzles over time. Remember the Occupy Wall Street movement? That fizzled out because no one had any concept of what the 1% does or how the 1% got their money and so on. And there was no clear message as to how to solve the problem of income disparity, which, by the way, will never be solved. Income disparity is all part of competition in a capitalistic society. But at any rate, you compare this to the Tea Party rallies. T, T-E-A, actually stood for taxed enough already, and it came about in part due to the massive expansion of government. And the message was clear and simple. We want limited government. Get government out of the way, reduce taxes, reduce regulations, and just let the people in the private sector thrive. That is something that is purely American. Those ideals are what made America the greatest country on earth. And it was successful. And we saw a red wave in the House of Representatives in the 2010 midterm elections. So what have these rallies done? They've done nothing more than motivate those on the right. Pro-gun, pro-Second Amendment folks are now racing to defend the Second Amendment. So the end result? The left does not accomplish its goal of having massive gun control, and the right is successful in letting everyone know just what the left thinks about the Second Amendment. Now, former Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens recently weighed in on this, and he said the Second Amendment should be repealed. Now, I want everyone to know the danger of those comments. First, as a former Supreme Court justice, all justices are charged with upholding the Constitution, including John Paul Stevens. And this includes upholding the Second Amendment. But we know not all judges interpret the Constitution as written. There are progressive, politically active judges on the bench, on all levels. The Second Amendment is not going to be repealed. 
To do so would require agreement among two-thirds of House members and two-thirds of senators, plus 38 state legislatures. You're not going to find 38 states to agree to remove Second Amendment protections from the Constitution. But that's where judges come in. You see, if you can't get an actual repeal, left-wing judges will determine for you how the Second Amendment should be interpreted. And slowly, case by case, they erode the Second Amendment. This is why it's crucial to appoint and confirm conservative justices to the courts so that all of our liberties are upheld and protected. Of course, this goes back to the gun control rally. Just as those on the right have been mobilized to defend the Second Amendment because of the rally, the comments from John Paul Stevens will do the same thing. And as further evidence, there was a huge increase to the NRA PACS donations from January 2018 to February 2018. In January, donations were slightly under $250,000. In February, they were slightly under $780,000. That's a huge increase. It shows people are actively giving money to the biggest organization defending Second Amendment rights. And this will continue if the left continues pushing its gun control and gun grab agenda. I want to remind everyone to please check out my Facebook page. Go to facebook.com slash southernconservative. That's facebook.com slash southernconservative. There you will find links to conservative news articles on stories you may not hear about in the mainstream media. Plus, if you follow the news feed, you'll find links to the daily podcast. Be sure to also subscribe to this YouTube channel. You'll be alerted each time a new podcast has been posted. New podcasts are posted daily, Monday through Thursday. Yesterday, Sarah Carter released an explosive article detailing how members in the CIA, FBI, and close associates of Barack Obama coordinated to bring down Trump's campaign. Now, if you listen to the podcast regularly, you know I've gone through the players in the Trump-Russia collusion case pretty extensively. And I've mentioned that one person we don't hear a lot about is President Obama. How involved was Obama? Did he know there was an active investigation into Donald Trump by the FBI? Did he know FISA warrants were being obtained against Carter Page? Now, there's no way in my mind that the president did not know. We know about the emails Susan Rice sent to herself in the final moments of the Obama administration, about a meeting that took place 15 days prior. In that meeting, Obama mentioned he wanted investigations done by the book, and that certain information may need to be withheld from the Trump administration. Who would talk like this? Who would write such an email unless it's meant to be a CYA? Well, this new article from Sarah Carter implicates someone very, very close to Obama, and it's now next to impossible to think Obama did not know what was going on. Sarah Carter writes, Documents obtained by congressional investigators suggest possible coordination by Obama White House officials the CIA, and the FBI, into the investigation into President Donald Trump's campaign. Those senior Obama officials used unsubstantiated evidence to launch allegations in the media that the Trump campaign was colluding with Russia during the run-up to the 2016 presidential election, according to newly discovered documents and communications obtained by Congress. The documents also reveal that former Senate Minority Leader Harry Reid of Nevada sent a letter on August 29, 2016, asking former FBI Director James Comey to investigate the allegations, which were presented to him by then-CIA Director John Brennan. Brennan had privately briefed Reed days earlier on the counterintelligence investigation, and documents suggest Reed was also staying in close touch with Comey over the issues. Now, we've already discussed Brennan's involvement in the dossier, spreading it to lawmakers on Capitol Hill, including to then-minority leader Harry Reid. The documents, which include text messages from embattled FBI Special Agent Peter Strzok and Lisa Page, also reveal that former Obama White House Chief of Staff Dennis McDonough was involved in the initial investigation into Trump's campaign. Comey, Brennan, and McDonough were the highest-ranking officials at the FBI, CIA, and White House, and were working in concert to ensure an investigation was initiated, congressional members told Sarah Carter. So Obama's chief of staff, Dennis McDonough, has his hands in this. You're just one person away from Barack Obama. 
so I don't see how Obama did not know what was going on. Now, these conclusions are based on this text message that Strzok sent to Lisa Page. Internal Joint Cyber CD Intel piece for D, that would be Director James Comey, Scene Center for McDonough Brief, Trainer, Head of FBI Cyber Division, directed all cyber info be pulled. I'd let Bill and Jim hammer it out first, though it would be best for D to have it before the Wednesday White House session. Now, more will have to be gleaned from this, but on the surface it suggests the FBI wanting to meet with Obama's chief of staff. Representative Mark Meadows of North Carolina, a member of the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee, was deeply troubled by these findings, saying, We've been asking for documents with little cooperation of the DOJ and FBI, or having to find these unredacted documents on our own. It appears there was a coordination between the White House, CIA, and FBI at the onset of the investigation, and it's troubling. Meadows said John Moffa, who was part of the Counterintelligence Division at the FBI, met with Dennis McDonough on August 10, 2016. Moffa was also the FBI agent who helped draft Comey's July 5, 2016 exoneration letter to Hillary Clinton's use of a private email server. And for what I've heard Sarah Carter report, some believe John Moffa was Peter Strzok's boss at the FBI. So this high-ranking official in counterintelligence at the FBI is meeting with Obama's chief of staff. And this same guy, John Moffa, was involved in helping to rewrite Comey's exoneration letter into Hillary's misuse of classified information. So this meeting happens on August 10, 2016, just days before Brennan talks to Reid, who then later writes an article describing about the need for an investigation into whether Trump colluded with the Russians. It's absolutely unbelievable. It wasn't until April 2017 that the New York Times published the first story about Brennan's counterintelligence briefing to Harry Reid regarding Donald Trump. The briefings to Brennan alluded to the unverified allegation that would be the dossier. The members of the Trump campaign may be colluding with the Russians. The information briefed to lawmakers expanded the number of people who were aware of the unverified allegations and played a significant role in the increase of leaks to the media, according to information obtained by the committee. A chain of events suggests the FBI encouraged Reid to write this letter to legitimize its surveillance of Carter Page. A congressional investigator told this reporter that they believe the FBI was involved in the briefing to Reid, but are still waiting for confirmation. In the letter from Reid to Comey, Reid cites information Brennan shared with him that Trump advisor Carter Page and other high-ranking sanctioned officials in Moscow were meeting. Reid asked Comey to launch an investigation by the FBI into the Trump campaign and the Kremlin. The letter, which was obtained by Sarah Carter, refers to reports briefed by Brennan but also gives no evidence regarding the Trump campaign and Russia, according to congressional investigators. For example, the letter only states that questions have been raised about whether a Trump advisor, who has been highly critical of the United States and European economic sanctions on Russia, and who has conflicts of interest due to his investments in Russian energy conglomerate Gazprom, met with high-ranking sanctioned officials in Moscow in July of 2016. Congressional investigators also note that newly revealed text messages between Strzok and Page also show possible coordination between the FBI, CIA, and the Democrats. Shortly after Reid's letter was revealed in a New York Times article on August 30, 2016, Peter Strzok texted Lisa Page saying, here we go. He included a link to the story in that text message. Congressional investigators suggest that the pair were creating inferences that they knew it would create public calls for an investigation into Russian interference. Meadows said documents suggest Reid's briefing from Brennan was used in Michael Isakoff's Yahoo News story. The September 23, 2016 article written by Isakoff cites Reid's letter is another example of possible coordination, congressional investigators state. The FBI used the Yahoo News article as part of the evidence in their application to obtain a FISA warrant on Carter Page. This sequence of events strongly suggests the FBI encouraged Reid to write his letter to legitimize its surveillance of Carter Page, congressional investigators stated. Okay, folks, let's sum all of this up. You have John Moffa, who some believe to be Peter Strzok's boss and a top official in counterintelligence division at the FBI, meeting with Obama's chief of staff, Dennis McDonough, in August 2016. 
During this same month, John Brennan, who was then director of the CIA, was discussing the dossier with Harry Reid, who later writes a letter for the New York Times asking for an investigation into Trump-Russia collusion. Now, we still aren't 100% sure what to make of the text message Peter Strzok sent to Lisa Page, but given the timing of all of this, it suggests the meeting between Moffa and McDonough was to discuss the investigation into Donald Trump. The bottom line is, this scandal now shifts to people very close to Obama. We need to investigate just how much Obama knew and when he knew it. Well, that's it for today's podcast, and that's it for this week. I hope everyone has a happy Easter or a happy Passover. I'll be back with another podcast on Monday.